The Phantom Fourth by J. Sheridan Le Fanu. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Phantom Fourth by J. Sheridan Le Fanu. They were three. It was in the cheap night service train from Paris to Calais that I first met them. Railways, as a rule, are among the many things which they do not order better in France, and the French northern line is one of the worst managed in the world, barring none, not even the Italian, Vie Ferret. I make it a rule, therefore, to punish the directors of, and the shareholders in, that undertaking to the most utmost within my limited ability, by spending as little money on their line as I can help. It was then, in a third-class compartment of the train, that I met the three, three as hearty, jolly-looking Saxon faces with stalwart frames to match as one would likely to meet in an hour's walk from the Regent's Park to the mansion house. One of the three was dark, the other two were fair. The dark one was the senior of the party. He wore an incipient full beard, evidently in process of training, with a considerable amount of grizzle in it. The face of one of his companions was graced with a magnificent flowing beard. The third of the party, a fair-haired youth of some twenty-three or four summers, showed a scrupulously smooth-shaven face. They looked, all three, much flushed and slightly excited, and, I must say, they turned out the most boisterous set of fellows I ever met. They were clearly gentlemen, however, and men of education, with considerable linguistic acquirements, for they chatted and sang and declaimed and did orations all the way from Paris to Calais in a slightly bewildering variety of tongues. Their jollity had, perhaps, just a little overtinge of the slap-bang, jolly-dog style in it, but there was so much heartiness and good nature in all they said, and in all they did, that it was quite impossible for any of the other occupants of the carriage to vote them a nuisance, and even the sourest of the officials, whom they chaffed most unmercifully and unremittingly at every station on the line, took their punishment with a shrug and a grin, the only person, indeed, who rose against them in indignant protestation was the head waiter at the Calais station refreshment room, to whom they would persist in propounding puzzling problems, such as, for instance, if you charge two shillings for one and a half ounce slice of breast of veal, how many fools will it take to buy the joint off you? And what he got by the attempt to stop their chaff was a caution to any other sinner who might have felt similarly inclined. As for me, I could only give half my sense of hearing to their utterings, the other half being put under strict sequester at the time by my friend O'Queen, the great Irish philosopher, who was delivering to me, for my own special behoof and benefit, a brilliant, albeit somewhat abstruse, dissertation on the visible and palpable outward manifestations of the inner consciousness of the soul in a trance, which occupied all the time from Paris to Calais, full eight hours, and which, to judge from my feelings at the time, would certainly afford matter for three heavy volumes of reading in bed, in cases of inveterate sleeplessness, a hint to enterprising publishers. My friend O'Queen, who intended to stay a few days at Calais, took leave of me on the pier, and I went on board the steamer that was to carry us and the mail over to Dover. Here I found our trio of the railway car, snugly ensconced under an extemporized awning, artfully constructed with railway rugs and greatcoats, supported partly against the luggage and partly upon several oars, purloined from the boats, and turned into tent-poles for the nonce, which made the skipper swear woefully when he found it out some time after. The three 
were even more cheery and boisterous on board than they had been on shore. From what I could make out in the dark, they were discussing the contents of diverse bottles of liquor. I counted four dead men dropped quietly overboard by them in the course of the hour and a half we had to wait for the arrival of the mail train, which was late, as usual, on this line. At last we were off, about half past two o'clock in the morning. It was a beautiful, clear, moonlit night, so clear, indeed, that we could see the Dover lights almost from Calais Harbor. But we had considerably more than a capful of wind, and there was a turgent groundswell on which made our boat double-engined, and as trim and tidy a craft as ever sped across the span from shore to shore, behave rather lively, with sportive indulgence in a brisk game of pitch and toss that proved anything but comfortable to most of the passengers. When we were steaming out of Calais Harbor, our three friends, emerging from beneath their tent, struck up in chorus Campbell's noble song, Ye Mariners of England, finishing up with a stave from Rule Britannia. But, alas for them, however loudly their throats were shouting forth the sway, proverbially held by Albion and her sons over the waves, on this occasion, at least, the said waves seemed determined upon ruling these particular three Britons with a rod of antimony, for barely a few seconds after the last vibrating echoes of the Britons never, never, never shall be slaves had died away upon the wind, I beheld the three leaning lovingly together in fast friendship linked over the rail, conversing in deep ventriguttural accents with the denizens of Neptune's watery realm. We had one of the quickest passages on record. Ninety-three minutes steaming carried us across from shore to shore. When we were just on the point of landing, I heard the dark senior of the party mutter to his companions in a hollow whisper and mysterious manner, He is gone again. To which the others, the bearded and the smooth-shaven, responded in the same way, with deep sighs of evident relief. Aye, Mary, so he is at last. This mysterious communication roused my curiosity. Who was the party that was said to be gone at last? Where had he come from? Where had he been hiding that I had not seen him? And where was he gone to now? I determined to know, if but the opportunity would offer to screw, by cunning questioning, the secret out of either of the three. Fate favored my design. For some inscrutable reason known only to the company's officials, we cheap trainers were not permitted to proceed on our journey to London along with the mail, but were left to kick our heels for some two hours at the Dover station. I went into the refreshment room to look for my party. I had a notion I should find them where the Britons' unswerving and unerring instinct would be most likely to lead them. It turned out that I was right in my conjecture. There they were, seated round a table with huge bowls of steaming tea and monster piles of buttered toast and muffins spread on the festive board before them. I, indeed, there they were. But quantum mutati ab illis, how strangely changed from the noisy, rollicking set I had known them in the railway car and on board the steamer, ere yet the demon of seasickness had claimed them for his own. How ghastly sober they looked now, to be sure, and how sternly and silently bent upon devoting themselves to the swelling of the Chinese shrub infusion and to the gorging of indigestible muffins. It was quite clear to me that it would have been worse than folly to venture upon addressing them while thus absorbed in absorbing. So I resolved to wait a more favorable opening and went out, meanwhile, to walk on the platform. A short time I was left in solitary possession of the promenade. Then I became suddenly aware that another traveller was treading the same ground with me. It was the dark, elderly leader of the three. I glanced at him as he passed me under one of the lamps. He looked pale and sad. 
The furrowed lines on his brow bespoke deliberation deep and pondering profound. All the infinite mirth of the preceding few hours had departed from him, leaving him but a wretched wreck of his former reckless self. A fine night, sir, I said to break the ice. For the season of the year, I added, by way of a saving clause, to tone down the absoluteness of the assertion. He looked at me abstractedly, merely re-echoing my own words. A fine night, sir, for the season of the year. Why look ye so sad now? Who were erst so jolly? I bluntly asked, determined to force him into conversation. Aye, indeed, why so sad now? he replied, looking me full in the face. Then, suddenly clasping my arm with a spasmodic grip, he continued hurriedly, I think I had best confide our secret to you. You seem a man of thought. I witnessed and admired the patient attention with which you listened to your friend's abstruse talk in the railway car. Maybe you can find the solution of a mystery which defies the ponderings of our poor brains, mine and my two friends. Then he proceeded to pour into my attentive ear this gruesome tale of mystery. We three, that is myself, yon tall bearded Briton, pointing to the glass door of the refreshment room, whose name is Jack Hobson, and young Emmanuel Topp, junior partner in a great beer firm, whom you may behold now at his fifth bowl of tea and his seventh muffin, are teetotalers. Teetotalers? I could not help exclaiming, Lord bless me, that is certainly about the last thing I should have taken you for, either of you. Well, he replied with some slight confusion, at least we were total teetotalers, though I admit we can now only claim the character of partial abstainers. The fact is, when, about a fortnight ago, we were discussing the plan of our projected visit to the great Paris exhibition. Top suggested that while in France, we should do as the French do, to which Jack Hobson assented, remarking that the French knew nothing about tea, and that a Frenchman's tea would be sure to prove an Englishman's poison. So we resolved to suspend the pledge during our visit to France. It was on the second day after our arrival in Paris. We were dining in a private cabinet at Desiree Borain's, one of the leading restaurants on the fashionable side of the Montmartre, Italian Boulevard. Our dinner was what an Irishman might call a most elegant affair. We had sipped several bottles of Sauterne and tasted a few of Tavo, and we were just topping the entertainment with a solitary bottle of champagne when I became suddenly aware of the presence of another party in the room, a fourth man, who sat him down at our table and helped himself liberally to our liquor, from what I ascertained afterward from Jack Hobson and Emmanuel Topp. The intruder's presence became revealed to them also, either about the same time or a little later. What was he like? I cannot tell. His figure and face remained indistinct, throughout, phantom-like. His features seemed endowed with a strange, weird mobility that would defyingly elude the fixing grasp of our eager eyes. Now, and to my two companions, he would look marvelously like me. Then, to me, he would stalk and rave about in the likeness of Jack Hobson. Again, he would seem the counterfeit of Emmanuel Topp. Then he would look like all three of us put together. Then like neither of us, nor like anybody else. Oh, sir, it was a woeful thing to be haunted by this phantom apparition. Yet the strangest part of the affair was that neither of us seemed to feel a whit surprised at the dread presence. That we quietly and uncomplainingly let him drink our wine and actually give orders for more. That we never objected in fact, to any of his sayings and doings. What seemed also strange was that the waiter, while yet receiving and executing his orders, was evidently pretending to ignore his presence. But then, as I dare say you know as well as I do, French waiters are such actors. Well, to resume, there he was, this fourth man, 
seated at our table and feasting at our expense, and the pranks that he would play. They were truly stupendous. He began his little game by ordering in half a dozen of champagne, and when the waiter seemed slightly doubtful and hesitating about executing the order, Top, forsooth, must put in his oar and endorse the command, actually pretending that I, who am now speaking to you, and who am the very last man in the world likely to dream of such a preposterous thing, had given the order, and that I was a jolly old brick and the best of boon companions. Surprise at this barefaced assertion kept me mute, and so, of course, the champagne was brought in, and I thought the best thing to do under the circumstances was to have my share of it at least, and so I had my fair share. But, bless you, it was nothing to what that fourth man drank of it. In fact, the amount of liquor he would swill on this and on the many subsequent occasions he intruded his presence upon us was a caution. We paid our little bill without grumbling, though the presence of the fourth man at our table had added rather heavily to the addition, as they call bills at French restaurants. We sallied forth into the street to, to get a whiff of fresh air. He, the demon, pertinaciously stuck to us. He familiarly linked his arm through mine, and, suggesting coffee as rather a good thing to take after dinner, took us over to the Café du Cardinal, where he, however, took none of the Arabian beverage himself, there being only three cups placed for us, as I distinctly saw but drank an interminable succession of chasse café, utterly regardless of the divisional lines of the cognac carafon. Part of these he would take neat, another portion he would burn over sugar, gloating glaringly over the bluish flame, while gleams of demoniac delight would flit across his ever-changing features. Jack Hobson and Top, I am sorry to say, join him with a will, in this double-distilled debauch, and when I attempted to remonstrate with them, they brazenly asserted that I, who am now speaking to you, who have always publicly and privately declared Brandy to be the worst of evil spirits, had taken more of it to my own cheek, as they slangily expressed it, than the two of them together. And the waiter, who had evidently been bribed by them, boldly maintained that Le vieux monsieur, as he had the impudence to call me, had swallowed plus de trois carafons de fine. Whereupon the fourth man, stepping up to him, punched his head, which served him right. Now you will hardly believe me when I tell you that at that very instant Top forced me back into my chair, while Jack Hobson pinioned my arms from behind, and the waiter had the unblushing effrontery to stamp and rave at me like a maniac, demanding satisfaction or compensation at my hands for the unprovoked assault committed upon him by me, Coram Populo, by me, who, I beg to assure you, am the most peaceable man living, and am actually famed for the mildness of my disposition, and the sweetness and suavity of my temper. And would you believe it? Everybody present, waiters and guests, and my own two bosom friends, joined in the conspiracy against me, and I actually had to give the wretch of a waiter ten francs as a plaster for his broken pate, and a saw for his wounded honor. Where was the real culprit all this time, you ask me? The fourth man, why, he quietly stood by grinning, and they all, and every one of them, pretended not to see him, though Top and Jack Hobson next morning confessed to me that they certainly had an indistinct consciousness of the presence throughout of this miserable intruder. How we finished that night, I remember not, nor could Jack Hobson or Emmanuel Top. All we could conscientiously stand by if we were questioned, is that we awoke next morning, the three of us, with some slight swimming in our heads, and a hazy recollection of a gorgeous dream of brilliant lights and sounds of music and revelry, and bright visions of groves and grottos and dancing horries, or hussies, as moral Jack Hobson 
calls the poor things. And a hot supper at a certain place in the Passage de Prans, of which I think the name is Peter's. I will not tire your courteous patience by a detailed narrative of our experience day after day, during our fortnight's stay in Paris. Suffice it to tell you that from that time forward to yesterday, when we left, the fourth man, as we, by mutual consent, agreed to call the phantom apparition, came in regularly to our dinner, with the dessert or a little after, that he would constantly suggest a fresh supply of Côte Saint-Jacques, Moulin Avant, Bonne, Chambertin, Rodel Carte Blanche, and a variety of other generally rather more than less expensive wines, and that he somehow would manage to make us have them, too. Then he would sally forth with us to the café, where he would indulge in irritating chaff of the waiters, and in slighting comments upon the great French nation in general, and the Parisians in particular, and upon their institutions and manners and customs. He would insist upon singing the Marseillaise. He would speak disparagingly of the emperor, whom he would irreverently call Le Lambert. He would pass cutting and unsavory remarks upon the glorious system of the night carts. He would call down the judgment of heaven upon the devoted head of poor Mr. Hausman. He would go up to some unhappy sergeant de ville, who might, however unwittingly, excite his ire and tell him a bit of his mind in English with sarcastic allusions to his cocket hat and his toasting fork and polite inquiries after the health of ce cher monsieur lambert or the whereabouts of cet excellent monsieur Gaudenau. the worst of the matter was that i suppose for the reason that man is an imitative animal a sort of greek pithecus myrios or Mombodian monkey minus the tail, my two companions were, somehow, always sure to join the wretch in his evil behavior, and to go on just as bad as he did. No wonder, then, that we got into no end of rows, and it is a marvel to me now how ever we have managed to get off with a whole skin to our bodies. He would insist upon taking us to Maville, the Closerie de Lila and the Chateau Rouge, where he would indulge in the maddest pranks and antics, and somehow lead us to join in the wildest dances, and make us lift our legs as high as the highest lifter among the habitués, male or female. One night, at about half-past two in the morning, Hibernice, he had the cool assurance to drag us along with him to the then-closed entrance to the Passage des Princes, where he frantically shook the gate, and insisted to the frightened concierge who came running up in his nightshirt that Peter's must and ought to be open still, as we had not had our supper yet, and Top and Jack Hobson, forsooth, must join in the row. I have no distinct recollection of whether it was our phantom guest or either of my companions that madly strove to detain the hastily retreating form of the concierge by a desperate clutch at the tail of his shirt. I only remember that the garment gave way in the struggle, and that the unhappy functionary was reduced nearly altogether to the primitive buff costume of the father of man in paradise, ere he had put his teeth into that unlucky apple of which the pips keep so inconveniently sticking in poor humanity's gizzard to the present day. And what I remember also to my cost is that the sergeant de ville, whom the bereaved man's shouts of distress brought to the scene, fastened upon me, the most inoffensive of mortals, for a compensation fine of twenty francs, as if I had been the culprit. And deuced glad we were, I assure you, to get off without more serious damage to our pocket and reputation than this, and a copious volley of sacre ivrogne anglais, fired at us by the wretched concierge and his friend of the police, who, I am quite sure, went halves with him in the compensation. Ah, they are a lawless set, these French. On another occasion, we three went 
to the exhibition, where we visited one of our colonial departments, in company with several English friends, and some French gentlemen, appointed on the wine jury. We went to taste a few samples of colonial wines. He was not with us, then. Barely, however, had we uncorked a poor dozen bottles, which turned out rather good for colonial, though a little raw and slightly uneducated, when who should stalk in but our fourth man as jaunty and unconcerned as ever? Well, he fell to tasting, and he soon grew eloquent in praise of the colonial juice, which he declared would, in another twenty years' time, be fit to compete successfully with the best French vintages. Of course, the French gentlemen with us could not stand this. They spoke slightingly of the British colonial, and one of them even went so far as to call it rotgut. I cannot say whether it was the spirit of the uncompromising opinion thus pronounced, or the coarsely indelicate way in which the judgment of our French friend was expressed, that riled our phantom guest enough it brought him down in full force upon the offender and his countrymen, with most fluent French vituperation and an unconscionable amount of bad jokes and worse puns, finishing up with a general address to them as members of the disgusting jury, instead of jury of degustation. Now, this I should not have minded so much, for, I must confess, I felt rather nettled at the national conceit and prejudice of these French. But the wretch, in the impetuous utterance of his invective, must somehow though I was not aware of it at the time, have mimicked my gestures and imitated the very tones and accent of my voice so closely as to deceive even some of my English companions, or how else to account for the fact of their calling me a noisy brawler and a pestilent nuisance, me, the gentlest and mildest spoken of mortals. Before our departure from London, we had calculated our probable expenses on a most liberal scale, and we had made comfortable provision accordingly for a few weeks' stay in Paris. But with the additional heavy burden of the franking of so copious an imbiber as our fourth man, thus unexpectedly thrown on our shoulders, it was no great wonder that we should find our resources go much faster than we had anticipated. So we had already been forcibly led to bethink ourselves of shortening our intended stay in the French capital, when a fresh exploit of the Phantom Fourth, climaxing all his past misdeeds, brought matters to a crisis. It was the day before yesterday, the 4th of September. We had been dining at Marinet and dancing at Mabille. Our eccentric guest had come in, as usual, with the champagne, and had, of course, after dinner, taken us over to the enchanted gardens. We were all very jolly. He suggested supper at the Cascades, in the Bois de Boulon. We chartered a fiacre to take us there and back. We supped rather copiously. He, somehow, made our coachman drunk and took upon himself to drive us home. Need I tell you that he upset us in the Avenue de l'Imperatrice, and that we had to walk it, and pretty fast, too? It was a mercy there were no bones broken. Well, as we were walking along, just barely recovering from the shock of the accident, he suddenly took some new whim into his confounded noddle. Nothing would do for him, but he must drag us along with him, to the great entrance of the Elysee Napoleon, which erst was, and maybe is soon likely to be once more, the Elysee Bourbon, where he had the brazen impudence to claim admittance, as the emperor, he pretended, had been graciously pleased to offer us the splendid hospitality of that renowned mansion. What further happened here, neither I nor either of my friends can tell. Our recollections from this period till next morning are doubtful and indistinct. All we can state for certain is that yesterday morning we awoke, the three of us, in a most wretched state, in a strange, nasty place. We learned soon after from a gentleman in a cocked hat who came to visit us on business that the imperial hospitality which we had claimed last night 
had indeed been extended to us only in the violon instead of the lsa our phantom guest was gone he would always somehow sneak away in the morning when there was nothing left for him to drink the guzzling villain the gentleman in the cocked hat pressingly invited us to pay a visit to the commissaire de quartier that formidable functionary received us with the customary french polished veneer of urbanity which as a rule constitutes the suavite in modo of the higher class of gallic officials he read us a severe lecture however upon the alleged impropriety of our conduct and when i ventured to protest that it was not to us the blame ought to be imputed but to the quatrain he mistook my meaning and ere i could explain myself he cut me short with a polite remark that the french used the cardinal instead of the ordinal numbers in stating the days of the month with the exception of the first and that he had had too much trouble with our countrymen he took us for yankees on the fourth of july to be disposed to look with an over lenient eye upon the vagaries we had chosen to commit on the fourth of september which he supposed was another great national day with us he would however let us off this time with a simple reprimand upon payment of one hundred francs compensation for damage done to the coach drunken cabby having turned up of course to testify against us well we paid the money and handed the worthy magistrate twenty francs besides for the benefit of the poor by way of acknowledgment for the imperial hospitality we had enjoyed we were then allowed to depart in peace now you'll hardly believe it i dare say but it is the truth notwithstanding that we three who have been fast friends for years actually began to quarrel among ourselves now mutually imputing to one another the blame of all our misadventures and misfortunes since our arrival in paris while yet we clearly knew and felt each and every of us that it was all the doings of that phantom forth one thing however we all agreed to do to leave paris by the first train to fortify ourselves for the coming journey we went to indulge in the luxury of a farewell breakfast at Desiree Borain. Of course, we emptied a few bottles to our reconciliation. I do not exactly remember how many, but this I do remember, that our irrepressible incubus walked in again and took his place in the midst of us rather sooner, even than he had been wont to do, and he never left us from that time to the moment of our landing at Dover Harbor, when he took his, I hope and trust, final departure with a ghastly grin i dare say you must have thought us a most noisy and obstreperous lot well with my hand on my heart i can assure you on my conscience that a quieter and milder set of fellows than us three you are not likely to find on this or the other side of the channel but for that mysterious phantom forth here the whistle sounded and the guard came up to us with a hurried, Now then, gents, take your seats, please. Train is off in half a minute. What can have become of Top and Jack Hobson? muttered my new friend, looking around him with eager scrutiny. I should not wonder if they were still refreshing. And he started off in the direction of the refreshment room. I took my seat immediately after the train whirled off, I cannot say whether the three were left behind. All I know is that I did not see them get out at London Bridge. Remembering, however, that the appalling secret of the supernatural visitation, which had thus harassed my three fellow travellers, had been confided to me under the impression that I might be likely to find a solution of the mystery I have ever since deeply pondered thereon. Shallow thinkers and sneerers, uncharitably given, may from a consideration of the times places and circumstances at and under which the abnormal phenomena here recited were stated to have been observed be led to attribute them simply to the promptings and imaginings of brains overheated by excessive indulgence in spiritous liquors but i 
striving to be mindful always of the great scriptural injunction to judge not lest we be judged and opportunely remembering my friend o'queen's learned dissertation above alluded to feel disposed to pronounce the apparition of the phantom of the fourth man and all the sayings doings and demeanings of the same to have been simply so many visible and palpable outward manifestations of the inner consciousness of the souls of the three and more notably of that of the elderly senior of the party in a succession of vino alcoholic trances my friend o'queen is of course welcome to such credit as may attach to this attempted solution of mine End of The Phantom Fourth by J. Sheridan Le Fenu.